Hey, good evening. Thanks for joining us for our Wednesday night service. Good to be back with you. Appreciate uh, Greg uh, filling in and others who've been uh, preaching on Wednesday night and Sunday night as well. Uh, we do hope in the not too distant future to reignite and start our sun, uh, Wednesday night services in the sanctuary. And so as we come up to that point, uh, this uh, format will probably go away, but we'll continue it for a little while. I want to remind you of some events this coming weekend on Saturday from 2 to 4.30 in the church parking lot. We'll be having sort of a Concord tailgate time just to come and hang out with people <clears throat> since we haven't been able to be together a lot through this past year, and this is just one of those events we're scheduling this year for our people to be able just to reconvene. So there will be soft drinks and water provided around the campus. The gym will be open. The playground is open. And we just pray that you will uh, find time to come and just hang out for a while, even if you can't stay the whole time. Uh, just come by and greet some people and just uh, reconnect with some of our, our fellowship. And then on Sunday, this coming Sunday, the 18th, we're very excited about the fact that we'll be presenting our long-range uh, building plans that we've been working on for a good long while through um, the company Equip, along with the long-range planning team from our church and with our pastors and staff. And so this coming Sunday, we'll have two services, one at 9.30 in the worship center, which will be a mask service, and then at 11 in the sanctuary, a mask optional service. And we'll be presenting those long-range plans in both of those services. Uh, there will be no adult Sunday school or student Sunday school, but children will be able to go to either Sunday school or to Brick House during the 9.30 and 11 a.m. times. Uh, nurseries provided, so uh, those things will run as per usual just during those times that we're meeting. And so we look forward to that and ask you to be in prayer for these uh, presentations on Sunday as we think about uh, God's vision and our future. Uh, we will have you know regular worship uh, through song and, and different things, but uh, then the sermon will be focused on that presentation. So again, be in prayer about that. And if you can't join us, uh, we will be live streaming the 11 a.m. Uh, presentation, so you'll be able to watch it uh, online. You know, a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> we celebrated the greatest event in human history, the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the grave. It is not something people can just write off, for it left such a continuing mark in human history. It was physical and it was real. And through it, for instance, Jesus' brothers became his followers and they called him Lord and they were his slaves. They said bond slaves. Before that, they had been skeptics. The only thing that can explain that is the bodily resurrection. His resurrection was so powerful that large numbers of Jews, right in the place where this took place, where he was nailed to the cross, right there, many of those Jews turned to follow Jesus as Lord, even many priests. You know, the Jews have seen many dead messiahs come and go. People proclaiming to be a messiah, then they died and their movement went nowhere. But they could not ignore one who came to life for good on the third day. Jesus really rose from the dead. <clears throat> now the Apostle Paul, as we saw on Easter, said that everything about our faith hinges on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And one thing that is contingent upon it is our own resurrections. Because Jesus rose from the dead, Paul says we too have assurance of our own resurrection. And he presents it like this, that Jesus is like the first fruit on the tree. That is when trees start producing fruit, he's the first piece of fruit that comes out, but it's a promise that more is coming. And that's what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 23. He says, for as in Adam all die, <clears throat> so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. And so he's the promise of more to come. Because we have the assurance then of eternal life and bodily resurrection, we can find strength and encouragement to live differently in light of the resurrection, compared to how the world lives around us that doesn't know Christ. Our lives as believers should be distinct, for we're living for something that has begun in us and that will come to fruition in the coming resurrection that will happen to us. And so because of that, we're admonished to live differently in light of who we are and what we have to look forward to. And tonight, I want us to look at an admonition Paul gives to us related to this fact 
in a message entitled, A Strong Admonition. Here in the text we're about to read, he sums up the application that should come out of our belief in the resurrection. So 1 Corinthians 15, just one verse here, verse 58. Paul says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Father, bless now your word and apply this truth through this verse to our hearts for our good and your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, at the end of a long chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, teaching about the coming resurrection of our bodies into that coming new heaven and earth, Paul exhorts them and us to live in a certain way. And since we have just celebrated the resurrection, I want us to look at how it should affect us tonight as we extrapolate from it and apply the truth that because Jesus arose, I know I will arise too. Now before I go through this, let me just uh, give a little explanation here because I think a lot of people, they don't understand what happens to us after we die. I had uh, read an article yesterday, I saw an article by uh, someone talking about the lack of understanding of Christians about what happens when we die. And I'm not going to preach the sermon on that, but just in a nutshell, the Bible says that when you and I die as believers in 1 Corinthians 5, that we immediately go to be with Christ, our spirits. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if I died right now, my spirit would go to be with Christ, and then my body would be placed in the ground in a grave because I would choose to be buried in that way. And then when Christ comes back, in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul talks about the bodies of believers rising. And in that passage, he also those talks about Jesus when he comes back, bringing with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So their spirits are people who have died and are with Jesus, like my parents right now are Christians. When he comes back, their spirits will come with him. If I died right now and my spirit went to be with Jesus and I was there at the second coming, we came back. Then our bodies are raised in power. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 is about. Incorruptible, full of glory. <clears throat> they are not exactly like these bodies because they are powerful, they're perfect, they're whole. And there is some continuity though. Paul <clears throat> talks about in this passage about planting a seed in the ground and what comes out doesn't look exactly like the seed, but there's a connection to it. And so at that point, my body glorified and raised as Jesus' body was raised, and my spirit are reunited, glorified, and in that sense, I am a living soul, body and spirit as a living soul, and I will live with Christ and His people in a new heaven and new earth. But right here, Paul is dealing particularly with the idea of the resurrection at the end of the body, and so what does he admonish them to do here in light of that? We believe this is going to happen to us. We know this is going to happen to us. Well, what does he say? Well, he admonishes them along a number of lines. First of all, he says here to stand firm. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, that is based on what I've just taught you about the resurrection, this whole chapter basically, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. That's the first admonition we find here. Now, the tense of the word stand in the original points to constant Christian stability. There is the sense here of continual growth and determination to become one who is a solid, stable disciple of Jesus in light of the fact that I'm being transformed and being prepared for the resurrection. The great Greek scholar A.T. Robertson, he translates it this way. Keep on becoming steadfast. The word is hydrios, and it literally refers to being seated or being settled in something. So for further clarity regarding what Paul means, look at 1 Corinthians 7, verses 36 and 37, where he's talking about something else in relationship to uh, getting married. 
But he says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 36, if anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably toward the virgin he is engaged to, and if his passions are too strong, and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has, listen, settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. But you notice here the idea of working through and settling something in his mind and in his heart that this is what he really believes is right. Well, Paul is admonishing us, or what Paul is admonishing us toward at this point, is rooted in the idea of continually growing, taking ground, and deepening in our commitment to Jesus to the point that we are really settled in it as believers. Not that we ever stop growing, but that we mature and we just become more grounded and and settled and mature as believers. It's similar to what Paul said in Colossians chapter 1 in verses 21 through 23 when he said this. He says, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, there's the idea, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, have become a servant. But you see the idea here that you grow and you're continuing in the faith but you're established and you're firm. Well, that's what Paul is trying to say when he says, in light of the resurrection, be steadfast. And as we look back on our lives as believers, you know, a time came when, when we understood and believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We trusted the living Christ for our salvation we identified with him in baptism, or we should have. And if you've not been baptized, you're commanded to be. And we began our new walk with him. It was a new beginning. But, and we must never forget this, it was a beginning. And the growth process never ends for us this side of glory. Therefore, from a position of security and grace, I know I'm saved and I'm secure with the assured hope of eternal life and a glorious coming bodily resurrection, we're called to strive to become ever more firmly settled in our commitment to the Lord Jesus. Now, there are a lot of ways we could apply this, but you know, there are three areas, I think, to which we should always give very close attention if we're going to be people who stand firm or get to this point of growing to where we are standing firm. And first of all, it's a matter of doctrine. The Bible repeatedly refers to the fact that a core of belief, a core of doctrine, has been given to us as believers. And we're to learn this doctrine, abide by it, live out of it. And in the New Testament, it is often referred to as the faith. And we talked about this briefly in the message this past Sunday from Jude, the half-brother of Jesus. In Jude, in verse 3, the one chapter in his letter, it says that we are to contend as believers uh, for the faith that has been once delivered to the saints. So the faith that's been once delivered, that's fully given to us as believers. And that's what the idea is related to doctrine. We've had doctrine given to us. Or Paul in Titus chapter 1 in verse 13, um, a similar uh, train of thought puts it this way. He says... Uh, this saying is true, therefore rebuke them sharply, that is, rebuke false teachers, so that they will be sound in the faith. And so the way one becomes well-rooted or seated, the way one stands in doctrine is through diligent, systematic, organized study of the Scripture, both individually and in conjunction with others. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul reminds Timothy, of the, the gracious way God has treated him in his life from childhood with people teaching him doctrine. It comes from his family, but he, he put this to him in this way in 2 Timothy 3, verse 14. He says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. So they're learning, being convinced and then he says, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And in the next verse, he talks about the profitability of scripture 
for teaching us how to live and follow Jesus. And so doctrine is important. That's why we need to be involved in placing ourselves under biblical preaching, solid, truthful, doctrinally centered preaching. And that is also why we need to be in a small group of believers as well who are pursuing uh, together the truth. And further, we should be pursuing our individual discipline of Bible study in our own private lives. You know, we live in a time where doctrinal beliefs are, are compromised on so many fronts. And it will take great courage and discipline and community to stand against this onslaught of heresy today. Make sure that you're in a church that is devoted to teaching doctrine, that you're hanging out with people who believe the doctrine, and that you're pursuing the truth of Scripture yourself. It's vitally important. But then secondly, as we think about standing firm, becoming steadfast, we're also to be doing this in the New Testament in relationship to ethics. We are to become steadfast, firm, immovable in relationship to ethical matters. That is Christian morality, right and wrong. You know, the Corinthian letter is all about Christian ethics. As Paul is seeking to help these recent converts from paganism to grasp that to be a Christian involves adjusting my life to the ethical demands of Jesus, Christianity, as defined by Scripture. And in this letter, he deals with a lot of things. He deals with their quarreling with each other, how they treat one another. He deals with sexuality. As we read a bit ago about marriage and virginity. He deals with marital relationships. He deals with lawsuits that are going on between Christians and tell them that it is an embarrassment that that's taking place. He deals with things like their former drunkenness, their former homosexuality, their former incest, their former idolatry, among other things, their sinful lifestyles that they've been called to leave behind as followers of Jesus. He deals with the use of money. He deals with the people one associates with closely, where you go in relationship to pagan gatherings and that sort of thing. We could go on and on. The simple fact of the matter is that as his disciples, we are to ever increasingly become like him. That's what Christian ethics is supposed to be, right? It's becoming like Jesus, who was perfect. And you know, it's been uh, a great disappointment to me over the years to see people sometimes fall in relationship to Christian ethics, not just in their choices, but also in their beliefs and what they teach. I think of um, one guy who's close to my age who was an ethics professor formerly at one of our seminaries, taught ethics. And he came out against traditional biblical marriage in favor of lifestyles forbidden by Scripture and uh, he left our denomination, I believe. But he still claims to be one of us. But I look at him in some ways like Jude about people being clouds without rain. He is not. He's different than somebody that's just in the church that's a younger Christian, not mature, wrestling through these issues and dealing with it in light of the pressures of culture. But someone with his level of training and understanding of Scripture must be devoid of the Spirit to move in the direction He moved. We must be moving in the direction always of standing firm, Paul says, according to the Scripture, ethically, knowing that we're moving to a resurrection in which we will be glorified and perfectly pure into a place where there is no sin. And that is the direction in which we're to be moving and leading others. You know, in 2 Peter chapter 3, coming at it from somewhat of a negative direction in the context of what he's talking about. Um, and he's talking here about the, um, the second coming. That's not negative, that's positive, but you'll get the point as I read this in just a moment about the destructive aspects of it. <clears throat> Peter talks about this in the same way. So we're talking tonight about you know, the resurrection, the, the good things that happen when we come to the end. But at the end, there's also going to be fiery judgment on the other side of things. And in 2 Peter 3, verse 10, beginning there in 11, he says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. 
just as an aside, I was uh, clicked on a Drudge Report a little bit ago, and Bernie Madoff, the great Ponzi schemer and uh, the guy that stole so much money, he died today in federal prison. But uh, I read the article, it didn't say this in the article, but the headline on Drudge was uh, Madoff in Hell. <laughs> and I'm thinking, do you really even know what you're, do you believe in hell in this culture? But that was pretty interesting headline to see on that uh, Drudge Report of all places, Madoff in Hell. Anyway, back to the point here. So Peter's talking about the coming uh, judgment and when this old system is burned up. And he says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Because we're not going to be destroyed, right? We're going to be preserved and our bodies are going to be raised. But he says, in light of this, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where what? Righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, listen again, make every effort. So he comes back, he doubles down on this. Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. What? What a great truth. Down in verse 18, he says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. You know, in the past, historically, and we've changed how we, we do it even here now, but in the past when we baptized people, <clears throat> we used to place on them white ropes. And I think it was a good practice. And I explained to people what the robe symbolized for us. And the robe that was white, symbolize that we are covered in the righteousness of Jesus. That is, when I've trusted Him, I'm forgiven of all of my sins, and His record becomes my record, and God sees me through the perfection of His Son. And that's why I was, I'm accepted by Him. <clears throat> and it was a reminder that not only does God see me as spotless in Christ, but it was also a reminder that I'm to be growing in steadfastness toward a pure life, and how I think and live as a believer. And so, you know, I put someone under the water and raise them up. and say, raise to live a new kind of life. And the water would symbolize in some senses like a watery grave, but also like crossing the Jordan into a new kind of life. And so I'm to be growing to be steadfast in my doctrine and in my ethics. Again, we find this theme so strong in the New Testament in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 following, uh, Paul says this, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we're all members of one body. So there's our speech. In your anger, do not sin, and don't let the sun go down while you're angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Then he deals with things we do through our body. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Then he deals with our mouths. Do not let any unwholesome <clears throat> talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. <clears throat> then he deals with our interpersonal relationships. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, is dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, who's our model, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And so we're to stand fast doctrinally. We're to find our standing and grow into being steadfast ethically. But also we're reminded in 1 Corinthians 15, 58 that... Um, 
that this is to be accomplished uh, corporately uh, as well. Not, I'm no longer just an individual walking in the world. I strive for the steadfastness through my corporate life with other Christians. And so you notice in verse 58, he says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, <clears throat> stand firm. So we're a part of a covenant family and we have a responsibility to our brothers and our sisters to help each other stand firm. So that's the first admonition. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. And then next he says, let nothing move you or to be unmovable. Let nothing move you. We can think of this as well as being immovable. Now the word used here is uh, the word amitakinatoi and it carries with it the idea of intensity in relationship to standing firm. But there's a difference, too, between this word and what we dealt with in the first point, as I understand it. Whereas the first thing he says, standing firm or be steadfast, implies taking ground. This one, I think, implies not giving up ground that you capture. Be steadfast it means you're pursuing, being grounded, but unmovable. Keep the ground you capture. Or, as some have suggested, another, I guess, nuance on this. The first word, be steadfast, captures the idea of not turning aside of yourselves. And this one means to not be turned aside by others. Listen, being a follower of Jesus entails being on the alert at all times from those outside forces which will seek to pull us away from the Lord. For the Corinthians, it was speculative, speculative philosophy. And for us, it may be any number of things. But just remember every day when you get up that not only have you acquired a friend in Jesus, you've also acquired an enemy in Satan and the world system in which you live. And he, Satan, desires every day to eat your lunch and to clean your clock. And so that's why Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, and just another reminder to us, verse 8, he says, Be alert. Do you live alertly? Be alert and of sober mind. You enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, listen, standing firm in the faith. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. So there's that idea again of standing firm, but it also comes along in conjunction with the idea of resisting the devil. So being immovable, being alert, not giving up ground to those outside forces of the enemy. So we are, in light of this and the coming resurrection, to be then unmovable. And then the third admonition Paul gives here in this passage is uh, he tells us to be busy. He says, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Be busy. You know, in the coming resurrection, we'll be rewarded for our life of service through the body. And we're not saved by these things or lost by not doing these things. <clears throat> but rather, these things show the quality of our faith and the reality of our faith. And God rewards us, His people, as we serve Him through these bodies for the things the Scripture says we've done in the body. And this text indicates that his people will be about working for him. So he says, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. As someone put it, faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. It is a busy faith that is accompanied by works. And this text indicates that it is hard work. Literally, it says uh, toil here is in the text. That we're to be uh, toiling for the Lord. It may involve also suffering. But notice, he puts in here very clearly, it is not in vain. No matter what we do, no matter how insignificant maybe the world thinks it is, what we do for Christ through these bodies is not in vain. And so in light of the fact then that Jesus arose, that Jesus is reigning and completing his work of a new heaven and earth, which includes me and includes you, and in light of the fact that I'll be raised physically, and receive God's mercy because I trusted in Jesus. 
and I'll be rewarded for faithful service in the body because I'm to seek to live out the admonition of 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So let's read it together again before I pray. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let us strive to understand this text and then by God's power to live out of it. Father, we thank you for the assurance of the reality of the resurrection of our bodies. And you've shown us the down payment of that, the first fruit of that, and the resurrection of Jesus. And Lord, we are excited about that. Um, we just pray you'd help us to live out of that in such a way it begins to transform everything about life here, that we truly know that we are saved, that Lord, um, if we die, our spirits will be with you. We should have no fear of death. And that, Lord, even these bodies will be raised, will be rewarded for our service to you as believers through the body. So help us to live in light of that and respond to it and be, Lord, Lord, um, open to uh, fulfilling and obeying this admonition from Paul to be steadfast, to be unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that this labor is not in vain. I pray that you would encourage hearts through this message tonight. Renew people's, uh, Lord, uh, desire to work and serve you and to be involved with your people, because Paul writes to brothers and sisters growing together. And Father, I pray that you would so work in our lives that, uh, Lord, people would know um, that we're truly yours, we're different, and help our church to become increasingly like that, Lord, in such a way that people will, Lord, know that uh, they're, they're people that are part of that fellowship who are trying to live out this truth in the Word of God. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name.